previously on Lost. Hello and welcome to the third and final part in my critique of Season 8 of Game of Thrones. Please don't make me do this. Please don't make me do this. This is going to be a long one, and be warned I will be thoroughly spoiling the entirety of Game of Thrones, and especially the series finale. If you haven't seen the first two parts of this critique, I'd recommend watching those first, as this part will focus primarily on the final episode of Season 8 and the series as a whole, The Iron Throne. This part will then break down each main character and compare and contrast where they began to where they ended, and analyse the effectiveness of their arcs. We will then discuss my ideas for the final season. I will discuss how this season should have gone whilst maintaining the previous seven seasons as they occurred, and then recreate season 8 with those ideas in mind. As such, this is going to be a very long video. So with that being said, let's not waste any more time. And then we come to the big last series and got to the very end. And I thought, hmm, okay. And all the people be? left alive are sat around the table. So, you know, what are we going to do now? Should we, should we have a cup of tea mm. or something? I thought, ah, oh, I don't know. This is it. The series finale. The episode the entire show has been building to. And we're about to pick up in the aftermath of Daenerys having her mental moment and destroying King's Landing, as well as her character. And we open on... Tyrion walking silently through a ravaged King's Landing for three minutes. Boy, this is some riveting stuff. Is this all Tyrion knows how to do now? Tell cringe jokes? Give useless advice and walk sullenly through battlegrounds? What a far cry he is from the cunning and brilliant character that was once many fans' favourite. And I'm not joking when I say three minutes. He just walks and walks and walks. John then comes across Grey Worm standing before a row of surrendered Lannister soldiers. Grey Worm is preparing to execute them, which begs the question, why are they in this position in the first place? Grey Worm already refused their surrender in the previous episode. They threw down their swords, and he and the Unsullied slaughtered them anyway. So why did he temporarily accept the surrender of these men? And why do so just to execute them anyway? We are literally just starting this episode, and the nonsense is already back in full force. I imagine this stupid little scenario was created just so John could come across them and face a moral conundrum. And I'm all for characters facing moral conundrums, but is it too much to ask that the scenario isn't an utterly contrived one? John tells Grey Worm that the battle is over, and they have surrendered and that there is no need to kill them. Grey Worm says he obeys the Queen and her command is to kill all those who obey Cersei Lannister. He says they are free men that chose to fight for her and thus must die. Firstly, Cersei is dead, so no one is following her anymore. But I suppose we can assume he means they must kill those that used to obey Cersei? In which case, why didn't he slaughter these men on the battlefield? Also, the idea that these are free men that chose to fight for Cersei is kind of absurd. In all likelihood, these men were drafted to fight for the Lannister army, or they were likely facing a life of abject poverty if they did not choose to join the army. They were also fed propaganda by Cersei and her network, which told them that Daenerys was a foreign invader coming to kill their families and enslave those that remain. So why wouldn't he feel a moral duty to fight back against that? And it turns out that propaganda was completely right. And even if it wasn't, and even if Daenerys had intended to take King's Landing and the Iron Throne peacefully, how are these men supposed to know that? Can you really fault these men for simply believing what their leader tells them? How are they to know if it's not the truth? My issue with this scene so far is not that Grey Worm wants to kill them, that much is at least consistent with his actions in the previous episode. My issue is with the logic of getting the characters into this situation, and of Grey Worm's horrendous attempt at logically justifying it. I doubt he would say much more than, they fought for Cersei, and they will die for Cersei. Jon stops Grey Worm from killing the men, and the Unsullied draw their weapons. This is fairly ridiculous, as the North and the Unsullied just fought two major battles together. Why would they risk throwing this allegiance away over a handful of Lannister soldiers? I also think it's incredibly important to remember that Grey Worm's logic for wanting to kill these men is that Daenerys has essentially ordered the death of all those that stand in her way. Keep that in mind, it'll be important for later. So the Northern soldiers draw their weapons in retaliation, but Davos calms the situation down by telling Jon they should go and speak to Daenerys. Jon agrees and heads off to find his queen. As he does this, we see Grey Worm execute the Lannister soldiers in the background. No. Jon wouldn't allow that. 
John is one of the few characters that has remained morally consistent on this show. He absolutely would have fought Grey Worm and the Unsullied to protect those surrendered men. He was raised as Ned Stark's son, and his unwavering morality was enshrined in him. He would absolutely not just stand by and allow those men to be slaughtered. What's more, it appeared that Grey Worm had essentially agreed to defer the execution until John had consulted with Daenerys. And then as soon as John turns to leave, Grey Worm kills them. This is such nonsense. We then see Tyrion silently walking through the Red Keep for another three minutes. Jesus Christ, with all the loose ends we need to tie up, we do not have time to be wasting on this. Just have him get to Jaime and Cersei. We can infer that he walked to get there. So Tyrion finds the chamber underneath the Red Keep where Jaime and Cersei died in the previous episode, thanks to some falling bricks. Despite what appeared to be the entire ceiling or even the entire castle falling on them, Tyrion finds them in mere moments, thanks to Jaime's gold hand sticking up through the debris. It's also worth pointing out that despite showing bricks falling all over this area in the previous episode, the chamber is relatively clear of bricks, except for the one spot Jamie and Cersei were standing. Damn, that's some bad luck. Or maybe they read the script ahead of time and knew to stand right where the bricks were going to fall. Tyrion then removes just a few bricks and quickly finds Jamie and Cersei's dead bodies. As good an actor as Peter Dinklage is, even he can barely muster some believable emotion for this crap. John then wastes more of the runtime of the episode, silently walking past the Unsullied and up the stairs to meet Danny. When he reaches the top, we see that Grey Worm has somehow beaten him there, even though it's implied that John went straight to Danny, whilst Grey Worm stayed behind to murder the Lannister soldiers. We then see the famous dragon wings shot, which is somewhat divided fan opinion. I saw some people gushing over the shot and declaring it should be taught in film schools, though I'm sure if you asked them why, they wouldn't be able to muster much reasoning. And I saw others lambasted as overrated garbage. I'm somewhere in the middle, but leaning towards the latter. I think it's a neat little visual, but it's quite on the nose and hackneyed if you think about it for longer than a few seconds. If you're inclined to say, ooh, that's a cool shot, when looking at this scene, then ask yourself, why? Maybe you think it represents her inner dragon finally coming out, or something like that. And that may be a perfectly reasonable interpretation. But that's already fairly obvious given that we saw a very literal version of that in the previous episode, when she destroyed King's Landing and murdered countless innocent people. Seeing that in a visual metaphor after the fact is somewhat redundant. If anything, this image should have been used before the destruction of King's Landing. Daenerys then gives her quasi-Hitler speech. I will say, despite the terrible writing this season, Amelia Clarke has really upped her game. I haven't always been enamoured with her performance as Daenerys, but she really knocks it out of the park in the last few episodes. Her performance almost makes me dislike the season even more, because it highlights in greater detail what could have been a brilliant ending if the writers handled it correctly. Daenerys' speech is a fairly important part of the episode, so let's break down exactly what she says. Firstly, it's kind of silly to think her tiny little voice would carry far enough for all of these people to hear her, especially given she's not talking particularly loudly. But that is rather picking at the nit. Although Drogon's roar is only just heard by those at the back here. Daenerys thanks them all for giving her the Seven Kingdoms, and names Grey Worm the Master of War. As if he wasn't essentially already in that position. Daenerys then says the war is not over. They will not stop until they liberate the entire world. She mentions places such as Dawn and Lannisport, which are odd given she is essentially taking control of Westeros, and even thanked her soldiers for helping her do it earlier in this speech. She also mentions Karth, among other places, which at least makes sense, given her past there. I saw some people claiming her speech was silly, given that she has essentially conquered and freed the rest of the world already. However, I'll defend the writers here a little. She has only really freed a few cities in Essos, such as Marine, and essentially most of Westeros. She still has most of Essos to free, as well as Southros. Her speech then ends as Tyrion makes his entrance. All in all, a fairly dull, if well-shot speech. We see reaction shots from Tyrion, Arya, and Jon looking on with dread, which seem a little silly given that Daenerys is talking of liberating and freeing people around the world, but I suppose her idea of liberating people is brutally murdering them whilst ignoring their ruler, so I can understand why they might be a bit worried. We now see even more Dothraki celebrating Danny's speech. 
which once again renders this impressive visual from episode 3, and its consequences, utterly redundant. We see Arya looking on concerned during Danny's speech, and Tyrion walks up to Danny and throws away his Hand of the King pin in rather dramatic and emphatic fashion. Danny says Tyrion freed Jaime and thus committed treason, and orders him to be taken. I guess she forgot in the previous episode where she promised Tyrion if he failed her again, it would be the last time, implying she would kill him. Now he has not only failed her, but outright betrayed her and publicly disowned her. And instead of having him executed immediately, she has him arrested and led away. Why? She captured Varys and executed him almost immediately. So why the delay in killing Tyrion? It's because this entire episode, much like most of the season, is utterly contrived nonsense. Danny then turns to leave and gives John a disgusted look for no apparent reason, even though moments later she seems delighted to see him. I guess this was to help sell the idea she is now mad, but it utterly fails. Arya then attempts to convince John that Daenerys is dangerous, as though that wasn't blatantly obvious from the fact she just burned down King's Landing a few moments ago. Arya says John will always be a threat to her as he is the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. She says, I know a killer when I see one. What a colossally stupid line of dialogue. Lines like this just highlight the ineptitude of the writers, particularly with characters such as Arya. I imagine they figured that Arya training with the Faceless Men meant she needed to constantly have mystical and mysterious dialogue to maintain her aura as a Faceless person, but they end up writing dumb lines like this. They're trying to make it seem like Arya is in a unique position to know a killer when she sees one, but it doesn't work here because everyone just watched Daenerys systematically murder hundreds of thousands of people. Jon then visits Tyrion in his cell. Tyrion tells him that their queen does not keep prisoners long. Why is she keeping you as a prisoner at all? In fact, Jon of all people should be questioning this as he just witnessed Grey Worm killing Lannister prisoners on the order of Daenerys. Is it too much to ask for things to make sense from one scene to the next? Jon says Danny is not her father, the Mad King, and continues to make excuses for the genocide Daenerys just committed, which was totally in character and not alien to her development at all. This ridiculous scene where Tyrion attempts to talk Jon into killing Daenerys lasts nearly 10 minutes. Not only is this a pointless waste of time when the purpose of the scene could have been conveyed in half that time at least, but it's also entirely redundant, as Jon Snow would not need to be convinced that a psychopathic mass murderer needs to be stopped. Even if he has been screwing her, Jon might not be Ned Stark's son biologically, but he was raised as his son with his values. Ned would absolutely have sacrificed his life to kill a genocidal maniac like Daenerys, even if he was deeply in love with her, because that would be the right and dutiful thing to do, and Jon would do the same. The writers are desperate to make this some sort of philosophical or emotional conundrum for John, but it rings utterly false. Sure, it would be difficult, and he might not relish the thought of doing it, but I don't believe for a second he would be making such nonsensical defences of her. Tyrion asks him if he would have done the same, and John says he doesn't know. This is unbelievable garbage. John then goes to see Daenerys. On the way he finds Drogon underneath a pile of snow and ash. I'll assume for logic's sake that this is supposed to be the ash of the burned city covering him, despite the fact it looks so white it appears to be snow. Of course, if it is supposed to be snow, then that just adds more questions, as at the end of season 7, it was starting to snow in King's Landing, but then by the midpoint of this season it had stopped. We see Danny walk through the destroyed throne room, mirroring her vision in the House of the Undying back in season 2. Instead of what we assumed was snow, it is actually ash falling through the destroyed ceiling. Whilst I appreciate them actually attempting to pay off something that was set up back in Season 2, instead of ignoring it like Quaith or retconning it like with the bells, I am still a little bit disappointed. Firstly, simply the method in which we got to this point taints the overall result. But putting that aside, it seems somewhat disappointing, although par for the course given the quality of Seasons 5 through 8, that this visual was entirely literal, and not in any way metaphorical or allegorical. Daenerys seeing Snow falling in the throne room could have been a metaphor for any number of things. It could have meant Jon Snow taking the throne. It could have meant the Starks marching on King's Landing like they did during Robert's Rebellion 20 years earlier. Or in other words, it could have been a visual representation of the Stark words, Winter is coming. It could have been a metaphor for the War of the Five Kings being consumed by the war with the Night King and the Army of the Dead. 
Hell, it could have even been a metaphor for Daenerys finally reaching the Iron Throne, only to be betrayed by Jon Snow. Instead, it was Ash, not Snow, and it was entirely literal. Still, I can at least somewhat appreciate that they didn't just ignore this vision entirely. Daenerys reaches the Iron Throne, and reaches out and touches it. I'll give the writers credit in that it seems somewhat fitting that after all of the work Daenerys has gone through to get to this point, she never actually sits on the Iron Throne. Perhaps that's a little obvious, or even on the nose, but I can somewhat appreciate the attempt at irony. Jon enters and asks her about Grey Worm executing the soldiers, to which she says it was necessary. So she knew about it? But how? She wasn't anywhere near them. And if she had simply given a blank order to kill any remaining Lannister soldiers, then why were they lined up as though they had surrendered? Why weren't they killed on the battlefield? Jon asks her why she chose to burn the city, exclaiming that there are CHILDREN DOWN THERE! Daenerys says it was necessary. Obviously it was the exact opposite of necessary, as Daenerys doesn't start to slaughter them until after the bells are rung and the city has surrendered. This I suppose is a way of selling her as mad, with her only choosing to murder the innocents at the exact moment she has absolutely no need to. And yet no matter which way you cut it, her decision to slaughter hundreds of thousands of innocent people makes absolutely no sense. It is completely at odds with her character up to this point. And you can only really argue it making sense by claiming she snapped and went mad at the moment the bells rang. This is a remarkably hollow argument, but let's assume for a moment it's correct. How is this not still terrible writing? Firstly, by the way, making this argument is essentially an admission that this is at odds with her character up to this point. If your argument is she snapped and went mad, then you are basically acknowledging that this is counter to her personality previously. But it's also terrible writing to have a massive character swap in the final moment of a story. I'm not saying that people can't snap mentally or change their way of thinking. I'm saying that to write a character this way in such a rushed and illogical manner is extremely poor writing and incredibly anticlimactic. Not to mention this type of turn is just begging for more development. And not just pre-turn, but perhaps even more so post-turn. If the writers decided they wanted to turn Daenerys into the Mad Queen, I'm not necessarily against it. In fact, it could be quite interesting, but to do so and then immediately kill her just stunk of disinterested writers throwing in one last shock and then rushing to the finish line to finally be done with the series. This is the type of character beat that requires tremendous setup, payoff, and resolution. And with Daenerys becoming the Mad Queen, we got none of them. Daenerys tells Jon that Cersei used the people's innocence as a weapon and that's why she did what she did. Jon asks her to forgive them, but she says she can't. Danny says that the world will be good because she knows what is good and so does John. John rather childishly asks, what about the other people that think they know what's good? And Denny responds that they don't get to choose. Daenerys asks John to be with her and help her build the new world. She says it's what's been needed since he was a bastard and she was a child that couldn't count to 20. This is a really weird line. Certainly John being raised as Ned Stark's bastard child and never knowing his mother and worse still his father never telling him about his mother would have been a rough upbringing. But why would Daenerys' example be that she was a child that couldn't count to 20? Is that really the worst moment of her childhood? Even if she was merely attempting to convey that they were both lost in the world as children or something, surely she could have come up with something more fitting than that. Or should I say, surely the writers could have. How about, and I was an orphan? Or, and I was a little girl controlled by my wicked brother? Or even, and I was the orphan daughter of the Mad King? Just about anything in her childhood would have been a more fitting accompaniment to John being a bastard than her inability to count to 20. Danny says they can rule together and break the wheel together. Those are contradictory statements. The wheel is the metaphor for the circular nature of life and those controlling it. If you become the supreme leader or absolute dictator, you aren't destroying the wheel at all. You've just become the one that spins it. John says she is his queen, now and always. This hack nonsense line which the writers insist on having John spew at every opportunity in favour of writing him some actual worthwhile dialogue was actually nominated for outstanding writing at the Emmys. Game of Thrones, The Iron Throne, written by David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. In case you needed more evidence that those award ceremonies are absolutely worthless, John then stabs Daenerys and she quickly dies in his arms. How fantastically anticlimactic. What an absolute mess Daenerys' story turned out to be. Outside of the shock value, what on earth was the point in turning her into the Mad Queen? And if they really wanted to go down that route, 
Wouldn't it have been infinitely more interesting if we got to see a little bit of the world under her rule? I'd have loved to see the reactions of many of the characters to her turn. What would Arya have wanted to do to Daenerys a month from now? How would Jon have handled things if he wasn't able to kill her straight away? How would the people in the rest of the Seven Kingdoms have reacted? The fact we never get to see much of the fallout to Daenerys' turn is a casualty of the rushed nature of the conclusion of the show. If the writers really wanted to go down this route, I wish they had just taken their time and done it properly. And that's pretty much my sentiment with the entirety of the show. The series as a whole feels like one big missed opportunity. The writers were handed a massively dense book series and instead of gradually working their way through it, and staying true, they rushed their way to the finish line, sacrificing the quality of the show in the process. Given how long it's taken George R. R. Martin to write The Winds of Winter, I'd say we're unlikely to see the end of A Song of Ice and Fire for at least another decade, if at all. Which means we will be lucky to see a Game of Thrones remake any time in the next 20 years. And given that HBO are busy working on the prequel, if that is anywhere near as successful as Game of Thrones was, we may never see a proper adaptation of A Song of Ice and Fire. It's a shame, and it makes the botching of Game of Thrones even more annoying. Not only did we not get a true adaptation of A Song of Ice and Fire, we didn't even get a good ending to the adaptation we got. Drogon then shows up, apparently having sensed that Daenerys had died. Jon places Danny down on the ground and turns to face Drogon. What's going to happen? Is Jon going to fight Drogon? Is he going to have to desperately run for his life as Drogon chases him amongst the ruins of the Red Keep? Is Jon going to tame Drogon and take him for himself, as after all, he is a Targaryen? It turns out he does none of those things. Drogon nudges Danny and quickly realises she's dead. He then snarls at Jon, apparently surmising that Jon is the murderer. Fucking Drogon Holmes over here. Hey stupid, maybe Jon just found her like this. Maybe the murderer is escaping as you confront Jon. Would he really be able to put two and two together? He is a fucking animal after all. Drogon then lets out a scream and decides to burn the Iron Throne. The throne melts under the intense heat of Drogon's fire, but doesn't just get destroyed instantly like the walls of the castle did. So I guess the power of his fire is determined by what visuals the filmmakers want in a certain scene. Those are some seriously good bolts holding down the throne. So let's quickly talk about the destruction of the Iron Throne. I'm all for it. While it may be a somewhat on-the-nose metaphor, I think it's a necessary one for the series. Of course, this is somewhat undone by Bran becoming king by the end of the episode, and, and the system just continuing on as it had previously. But still, I think it's a neat visual allegory. What I don't like is how we got there. Jon killing Daenerys is fine, if a tad cliché, but from a character point of view it makes sense. After Daenerys had slaughtered all those innocent people, it wouldn't make sense if Jon didn't want to kill her. He put aside his feelings and did his duty, and that is consistent with his character throughout the series. The biggest issue I have with Drogon melting the Iron Throne is just that, that Drogon melts the Iron Throne. He doesn't have a reason for doing this, he just does it. The show sells it like he is so upset at Daenerys' death that he just has to burn something. But given the show implies that Drogon knows that Jon killed Danny, then why does he choose to burn the Iron Throne rather than Jon? The stupid thing is, this could have been done in a logical way. Let me give two examples. Firstly, assuming everything in the season happens exactly as it happened, and we don't change anything to try and fix this mess, then we arrive at the moment that Drogon figures out Jon killed Danny. He then furiously tries to kill Jon and avenge his mother's murder. He starts trying to blast Jon with dragon fire as Jon dodges it and hides behind the fallen walls and ceiling. Jon runs behind the Iron Throne and Drogon blasts it with fire. Jon escapes behind the open wall, but Drogon doesn't see that and continues to melt the Iron Throne, thinking Jon is behind it. There. That was easy. It makes sense. Drogon tries to kill Jon. And you get the melted throne. Now here's another example. But we have to change a few things first. So let's assume the White Walker storyline wasn't completely ruined and thrown in the trash in episode 3. I'll go into this idea much more thoroughly later in this video, but let's assume for argument's sake that the Night King manages to reach King's Landing. During the inevitable battle, the Night King riding Viserion ends up destroying the Iron Throne during his attempt to kill everyone. Perhaps he is trying to kill Jon and Danny as they fly Rhaegal and Drogon and they crash through the walls of the throne room and the Night King melts the Iron Throne. It's just an off-the-cuff idea, I'm sure there are many more that people can come up with. And that's the point, really. That just a few moments of thought and you can come up with an idea that works and is more interesting than Drogon simply deciding for no reason to destroy the Iron Throne. Drogon then picks up Daenerys and leaves. Where's he going? What's he going to do with her body? Who knows? Who cares? Let's wrap this shit up. The episode then cuts to black, and when it resumes, we see Tyrion being brought before a council of lords and other characters in the Dragon Pit. 
We are informed that Jon Snow has been taken prisoner for the murder of Daenerys. We are left to assume the details of how we got to this point. Okay, let's try and figure out how Jon got from here in the throne room to here in this cell. So Drogon flies away with Daenerys' body and Jon is left with a few options. Option one is to leave the throne room and try and flee King's Landing before anyone realises that Daenerys is missing. The second option is to go outside and tell Grey Worm that Daenerys has gone for a ride with Drogon, and that she seems to be in a weird mood and has destroyed the Iron Throne, and that maybe he should look into building her a new one. Third option is to go to Grey Worm and confess that he killed Daenerys. This is the one I assume he took. It's the dumbest one, but it is the most honourable, I suppose. At least in the show's idea of honour. So how did Jon get from confessing to murdering Daenerys to this cell? Well, that's the part that makes the least sense. Because I imagine that as soon as he told Grey Worm, or as soon as Grey Worm found out, he would have killed Jon right then and there on the spot. Why wouldn't he? He is universally loyal to Daenerys. He would absolutely kill and die for her. I imagine he would have taken Jon's head off right there. He was willing to slaughter surrendered Lannister soldiers for no reason, so I'm sure he'd be willing to kill Jon after Jon killed his queen. And who's going to stop him? The army he commands just conquered the city. Now it's possible he was worried that if he just killed Jon the Northern Army would revolt and attack his army, but he could have killed Jon in private and then declared that a Lannister loyalist killed both Jon and Danny. Who would be able to claim otherwise? My point is Grey Worm is a fairly bloodthirsty character at this point, and I doubt he'd be willing to arrest Jon and feed him for two weeks before conversing with the lords and ladies in the Dragon Pit. And the same goes for Tyrion. This all just stinks of forced writing. It's just the writers forcing their chess pieces across the board, regardless of the pre-established rules and conditions. We then cut to what appears to be a few weeks later, and Tyrion is brought before a council in the Dragon Pit by Grey Worm to answer for his betrayal of Daenerys. Here's the thing. Grey Worm has two hostages captive, Jon and Tyrion. And I'm sure he's not dumb enough to think a council made up of their friends and family are going to happily agree to them being executed. So why doesn't he kill them himself? He has them captive, and there's not much the others could do to stop him. Sure, they could bring in the armies from the Vale and the Riverlands and Dawn to destroy the Dothraki and Unsullied, but those armies would take weeks to arrive. Grey Worm could easily kill both men and then leave with his army if he so wanted. Or, if he wants to use Jon and Tyrion as bargaining chips with the other lords, then he could always just kill one of them. Jon has more friends and family than Tyrion, so he would be the more valuable one. Tyrion has no remaining family, so he could be killed without much fear of reprisal. And it's not like Grey Worm hasn't been portrayed as thoroughly bloodthirsty. I highly doubt he'd have taken Jon alive after Jon killed Daenerys, but maybe, just maybe, I could stretch my disbelief far enough to buy that he'd keep him alive as a bargaining chip should other armies arrive on the scene. But what purpose does keeping Tyrion alive bring Grey Worm? Daenerys said the next time Tyrion failed her, she would execute him. And then he very publicly denounced her. She would have likely had him killed on the spot, but once she was killed, I don't think for one second Grey Worm wouldn't have killed him himself. Tyrion should absolutely be dead at this point, and his continued survival, for what appears to be a few weeks, is ridiculous. And if you're wondering where I'm pulling the few weeks thing from, well in the time since Daenerys was killed, Sansa has travelled from Winterfell to King's Landing. I suppose she could have sailed there, but I believe most, if not all, of the fleet was destroyed by Euron in the attack that killed Rhaegal. Regardless, given that we now have the likes of Edmure Tully, Robin Arryn, and the new Prince of Dawn, name TBD, here in the Dragon Pit, it stands to reason that some time has passed. Also, later in this scene, Tyrion just straight up acknowledges that it's been several weeks. So there's that. I've had nothing to do but think these past few weeks. So we're supposed to believe that Grey Worm and the Unsullied kept Tyrion and Jon alive for weeks, feeding them and giving them water after they publicly denounced Daenerys and then killed her respectively. Well, I don't buy that at all. This is just monumentally lazy writing. So in the Dragon Pit, we see the assembled lords and ladies of Westeros. We have Lady Sansa, the de facto leader of the North, Edmure Tully, who I suppose is the Lord of the Riverlands, and the Twins, Robin Arryn, the Lord of the Vale, the Nameless Prince of Dawn, Gendry Baratheon, the Lord of Storm's End, and Yara, the Lady of the Iron Islands. Then, for some reason, there's also Bran, Arya, Brienne, Sam, and Davos. They're there because the audience knows who they are and likes them, so that's why. Davos offers Grey Worm and his men the Reach, as if he can just do that. 
This is the man that says he's not sure he even gets a vote when it comes time to vote for the new king, but he seems to think he can just offer up an entire portion of Westeros to a foreign army. What do you think the people that live in the Reach might think about that? Do any of these people even care about that? Do the writers? Grey Worm says they just want justice and they want Jon Snow dead. Not to beat a dead horse, but then why haven't you killed him already? Imagine wanting someone dead, but instead you feed and water him for two weeks. Likely literally cleaning up his shit, all the while seething with hatred for him, but not killing him because you want to ask his brother and sisters for permission first. What is this nonsense writing? Tyrion says that's not for Grey Worm to decide. Well, I'll beg to differ, Tyrion. He's the one that has Jon Snow locked up in a cell right now. In fact, it was up to him to decide the moment Jon Snow killed Daenerys. And there's literally nothing stopping him. The only threat is that the armies of the assembled lords and ladies would likely declare war on Grey Worm and his army. But he had to keep Jon captive for weeks to allow them to arrive. He's just stated he doesn't care about lands and he wants Jon dead instead. So why not kill him immediately and then leave Westeros before the other armies arrive? Tyrion says it's for the king or queen to decide. The assembled lords say they don't have one and Tyrion tells them to pick one. And the first thing Arya and Sansa should be saying, and Tyrion too come to think of it, is that the rightful heir to the Iron Throne is Jon Snow. He is the legitimate heir to Rhaegar Targaryen and Daenerys was illegitimate. Jon is their king and if Grey Worm does not hand him over safely, then he and his men will be destroyed by the combined might of the Seven Kingdoms. Hell, this is even something of an out for Jon having killed Daenerys. He not only killed her because she massacred innocent people, but she was essentially a usurper. She was not the rightful heir, Jon was. And by killing her, he took his rightful place as king. Grey Worm almost certainly wouldn't go for that, but at least there's some legitimacy to that idea. Grey Worm then agrees and tells them to decide. Easy, it's Jon Snow. Come on, Arya and Sansa, you both know Jon as the rightful king. You too, Bran and Tyrion, come on. Come on, do the right thing. Name Jon as king. Hell, Tyrion, you're the one who talked Jon into killing Daenerys. The least you owe him is to bring up that he is the true-born son of Rhaegar. No. Why not? Why aren't you mentioning this? Sam. Sam knows that Jon is the true heir. He was the one who discovered it first and proved it with his work in Old Town. Surely Sam, Jon's best friend for years, will mention that Jon is the rightful heir. No, of course he won't, because that might make sense, and we're long past that, aren't we? Okay, so let's pause here for a moment and break down the reasoning behind why Jon doesn't become king. Firstly, it would be something of a cliche. Secondly, it's just not what the writers want to do. They want Bran to be king, but they also don't want to kill Jon. So they just write that Grey Worm doesn't kill Jon when he obviously could and likely would. And they write it so that half a dozen characters that would logically say that Jon is the rightful king just keep quiet instead. This is the laziest type of force writing there is and the showrunners don't seem to give a damn. It's such a shame because the series started out with so much potential and then halfway through it just turned to shit. Compare the ending of this show with something like The Shield, which arguably got better as it went on had a great final season, and put out the best series finale I have ever seen. Shows don't have to turn to crap. The writing doesn't have to get poor. And you shouldn't settle for substandard storytelling. Nor should you sift through the debris of a ruined series and try and piece together an ending that doesn't exist just because you can't bring yourself to admit that a series you love that was once brilliant has turned to garbage. If a series is great and maintains its quality then you don't have to clutch at straws to defend it from scrutiny. Just because nothing is perfect doesn't mean you have to accept garbage. Edmure then offers himself up as a potential king. He bumbles around a little bit and then is embarrassingly told to sit down by Sansa. Let's stop and talk about Edmure just briefly. I always hoped something would come of his character. Christ, I wonder how many characters in this show you can say that about. We saw him in a couple of episodes in season 3 before he was whisked away during the Red Wedding, and I always wondered if and when we'd see him again. Then he briefly showed up again in Season 6, and now we see him again here. Basically a solid actor being completely wasted with a character that does and accomplishes nothing. Again, how many characters can you say that about on this show? Sam suggests democracy in allowing every citizen a vote, which is thankfully laughed at by everyone. I was genuinely worried they were going to have some cheesy cornball moment, where everyone agrees to give the people a vote, which would have been par for the course with this show. Thankfully, that was avoided. And it's not that giving the people a vote is a bad thing, it's that it just wouldn't have made sense in this kind of world. 
This is a meeting of lords and ladies, none of whom would believably want to leave the fate of the Seven Kingdoms up to a vote of the commoners. Although Sam being the one to suggest it did make sense, so that's another point in the favour of the series. It makes sense that a man like Sam, who had his rights to lay claim to land and titles, essentially stolen from him by his father, and was forced to make something of himself from nothing, would be the one to suggest letting the common people have a say. Tyrion then says that people love a good story, that it unites them, and he practically winks at the fucking camera as he says it. The nerve of you two. And no, D&D, this hasn't been a good story. It started out as a good story when you were sticking to the book material, but then you mistook yourselves for Shakespeare instead of the writers of X-Men Origins Wolverine and Gemini Man, and decided to start changing and cutting book material and it all turned to shit. You're right about the uniting part though, the final season has united many of us in our hatred for it, and in shitting on it, and you, from a great height. He then says, who has a better story than Bran the Broken? And who has a better story than Bran the Broken? (laughs) You serious? Well, I can think of one. How about John? The rightful heir to the Iron Throne? John was born a prince and raised a bastard. His parents feared that if King Robert should learn that he was the son of Rhaegar, he would be killed. So he was raised as a bastard by his uncle. Then he joined the Night's Watch, went beyond the wall, infiltrated the wildlings, fell in love, fought the wildlings in a war, watched the love of his life die in his hands, become Lord Commander, was assassinated by disgruntled subjects, was raised from the fucking dead, won a war against the Boltons to reclaim his family home, became king in the north, allied with Daenerys Targaryen, fell in love with her, went beyond the wall to capture a zombie, fought and won a war with the undead, rode on a dragon, found out he was actually the rightful king and turned it down, fought and won the war for King's Landing and killed the genocidal Daenerys despite being in love with her. Now let's compare that to Bran's story. He was pushed out of a window and became paralysed. He went beyond the wall to learn how to see the past and future with the Three-Eyed Raven. Then he was used as bait to lure the Night King into a trap that only worked because the Night King is a complete moron. That's it. There is no comparison here. Jon easily has the better story. He's practically the thing of legend anyway. Bran didn't even get to walk into a dragon and fly around like was implied in the fourth season finale. The most he did was warg into some crows. Hell, just about anyone has a better story than Bran. Tyrion has a better story himself. This is remarkably dumb. Tyrion says nothing is more powerful than a good story. He says Bran is their memory and asks who is better to lead them into the future. How about Jon, the actual rightful heir? Did killing a genocidal maniac suddenly disqualify him from being the rightful heir? Why is no one even bringing Jon up? Am I supposed to believe that even his own brother and sisters won't even mention him? It would be one thing if he was brought up, because surely if the writers really didn't want Jon to sit on the Iron Throne, then they could have written the characters to debate over his merits, given the current predicament, and come up with a reason as to why he can't be king. Or maybe they couldn't, and that's why no one mentioned him. Maybe the writers just couldn't come up with a good reason, so they wrote the scene to have no one mention Jon. Who knows? What I do know is that this makes absolutely no sense. Bran is about the least reasonable person to pick as king. Sansa says he can't father children. I was going to make an argument that he likely could still father children despite being paralysed. But I'll let it go and chalk this up to the time period. Although, given that he would be king, he'd have practically unlimited resources, so in all likelihood he could still father children. But fine. Let's just assume he can't. Tyrion claims this is a good thing, as from now on, kings will be decided by a vote rather than being born. Yeah, I'm sure that will last. So when Bran dies, the lords and ladies will vote for the next king, and he will likely not be paralysed and will be able to have children, and then when he dies, do you really think his children will just accept no longer being king? We still have royal succession in the present day. In no way do I believe that this isn't going to be ignored as soon as the king after Bran is decided. Tyrion says he knows Bran doesn't want or care about power, but asks him if he'll do it anyway. Bran responds by saying, why do you think I came all this way? Which is a rather weird and somewhat sinister response. It implies that Bran knew he would be handed the crown, and almost implies it was his plan all along. I don't think that was the tone the writers were going for, but it still crossed my mind thanks to the weird wording. 
Everyone seems to agree, and they then hold a vote with Bran winning by unanimous decision. Davos says he's not sure he gets a vote, but says I nonetheless. Brienne, Arya, and Sam don't seem to be as self-aware and vote as though they deserve a say when they hold no lordships at all. This is all so dumb. It makes absolutely no sense for a king to be voted into power when the rightful king, Jon Snow, is still alive. It would make a certain type of sense if Jon was dead, but he's not because the writers want to have their cake and eat it too. So Jon must stay alive for the ending shot to happen, but also can't be king so that the ending shot can happen, and thus we get Bran being nonsensically selected as the new king. Thanks. I hate it. Sansa says Bran will be a good king, but the North needs its independence as they can't kneel again. Bran agrees. Nobody else votes on this, and the North is granted its independence, while Bran is declared the Lord of the Six Kingdoms. And just when you thought this scene couldn't get any dumber, this happens. Why would the North need its independence now that a Stark is king? Well, maybe Sansa is worried that the next king won't be a Stark, and thus they might be persecuted under future rulers. Okay, makes sense. But if a future king wants the North to come under his rule again, then how on earth will the North stop him? Can the Northern army possibly defend the North against the invading forces of the Crown? No other kingdom demands independence, so feasibly you could see a future war between the North and the rest of Westeros. I wonder who would win that war, huh? This is the point I was referencing back in part one when I made a comparison between the independence both the US and Australia have from the UK. America won the Revolutionary War and took their independence, whereas Australia asked for independence and it was granted. The US is no longer a part of the Commonwealth and is in no way controlled by the UK. Whilst Australia, Canada and New Zealand, among others, are still under British rule with quasi-independence. In Game of Thrones, Sansa gets independence for the North, but it's not won in battle, it's handed to her by her brother. This is good in the sense that it avoids bloodshed, but bad in the sense that it is a tenuous independence at best. If a future ruler wanted to rescind that independence, there would be little the North could do to stop it. Basically what I'm saying here is that it was a hurried end to a lingering plot point, rather than a believable achievement. What makes this worse is that none of the other lords demand independence. If they did, it's likely Bran would have to say no, but then it's clear he's just playing favourites with his home kingdom. And then immediately he's essentially a corrupt king and this new system of voting is rendered pointless. So either he grants each kingdom their independence, in which case he no longer has a kingdom to rule, or he says no and is now a biased king. The writers avoid this conundrum by simply not having any of the other lords ask for independence, which of course makes no sense, especially with regard to the Iron Islands and Dawn both of which have a long history of rebellion and refusal to bend the knee. But the Prince of Dawn doesn't even get a name, and the unlikelihood of Yara becoming Queen of the Iron Islands is completely ignored on the show, so let's just move on. Actually, let's just briefly discuss Yara becoming ruler of the Iron Islands. How the hell did that happen? Was there a king's moot? Did she just conquer the Iron Islands? If so, how? This could have all been shown if the season wasn't a ridiculously rushed six episodes. The lords then all hail the new king, Bran the Broken. Yes, I am aware my spine is broken, does that really have to be my name? Bran says Tyrion will be his hand. Tyrion says no, that he doesn't want it. He's stealing Jon's lines now. One of the two he gets this season. He asks Bran to choose someone else. Bran says he chooses Tyrion. Grey Worm says he cannot. And Bray Worm... And Bray Worm... And Bran says he can as he is king. If Grey Worm was not going to accept anything other than Tyrion's death, which is implied by his response, then why not just kill him? We then cut to Tyrion visiting Jon in his cell. Tyrion tells Jon, Bran has sent him to the Night's Watch to avoid a war with Grey Worm. So if you are appeasing Grey Worm to avoid a war, then that implies the hypothetical war could possibly be lost to Grey Worm and his forces, right? If it would be an easy victory, then there's no reason to appease him. So you're sending Jon to the Wall to avoid a battle with Grey Worm, because you might lose that battle. So if Grey Worm's position is that strong, why would he just stand back and allow Bran to pardon Tyrion, and allow Jon to skate with a relatively minor punishment? Grey Worm likely wouldn't know what the Night's Watch even is. And once it's explained to him, and it's explained that Jon has spent several years of his life there already, and that he chose to go there voluntarily in the first place, then why would Grey Worm consider that a fair punishment for killing Daenerys? Not to mention, once Grey Worm and his forces leave Westeros, what's to stop Bran simply pardoning Jon? 
I don't believe for a second Grey Worm would settle for anything other than John's head. Maybe if Masande was still alive, he'd settle for John joining the Night's Watch to avoid a battle and ensure he could live a happy life with her. But she's dead, and Grey Worm is still clearly bitter about it. He really doesn't have much to live for. Especially now that Daenerys is dead as well. This all just seems like the writers wanted to avoid Jon sitting on the Iron Throne at the end of the series, but also didn't want to kill him. So they figured he needed a bittersweet ending to his story. But instead it just rings false. Jon asks if there even is a Night's Watch anymore. Which makes sense given that the purpose of the Night's Watch was to protect the people south of the Wall from White Walkers and Wildlings, both of which they essentially failed to do. The Wildlings are past the Wall and the White Walkers are all dead. Plus a huge chunk of the Wall was destroyed so I'm not sure what good the Night's Watch will even be. The majority of men at the Night's Watch were criminals that chose service over death. And this was because the realm needed men to serve on the wall. But the realm no longer needs those men to serve, so what exactly is the point of it? Tyrion says it will be a home for broken men. Jon asks Tyrion if what he did was right because it doesn't feel right. Tyrion tells him to ask him again in ten years. What? Honestly, after the shit Tyrion pulled over the last two episodes, he is a complete piece of shit. He manipulates Jon into killing Daenerys. Then when it comes time to choose a new king, he doesn't so much as mention Jon Snow's name, even though he knows full well that Jon is the rightful heir and just destroyed perhaps his last chance at happiness by killing Daenerys to save the world from her tyrannical and genocidal rule. And even after that, when all Jon wants is a little reassurance that what he did was right, Tyrion, the man who talked him into it, doesn't even give him that courtesy. He of all people should have told him that what he did was right. He should have told him that he did what he did to save further innocent lives from being slaughtered, and that he knows how difficult it must have been but he did the right thing. After all, he was the one who talked him into it. But no, the writers thought it would be more poetic to leave things on an emotionally ambiguous note. And so Tyrion metaphorically spits in Jon's face for the second time this episode. This is absolutely garbage writing, and if there was any doubt to the destruction of Tyrion's character before this, that doubt has disappeared. We cut to Jon on a pier as he is greeted by men of the Night's Watch. I guess in the few weeks since he was captured, the Night's Watch has simply reformed with new instructions of how to proceed. But that doesn't make sense because Bran only just became king. So has even more time passed? Who knows anymore, the writers sure don't seem to. Jon says goodbye to Arya, Sansa and Bran. We see Grey Worm taking the Unsullied and Dothraki to Narth, which will likely lead the entire army to be killed by the poisonous butterflies. Arya then tells Jon she's not going back up north. She asks them, what's west of Westeros? And they don't know. She says no one does, and that's where she's going. I'll tell you what's west of Westeros. The eastern coast of Essos. You're gonna end up in a shy, and maybe you'll meet the real Euron Greyjoy there. Realistically though, this decision of Arya's makes little to no sense. Maybe it would have fit if she were travelling back to Braavos to join the Faceless Men properly, or if she were intentionally travelling to the east coast of Essos to visit the weird places like Ashai, in the hopes of becoming an even better assassin. And as I mentioned in part one of this critique, it would have been rather interesting and somewhat subversive if she had decided to marry Gendry and start a family, which would completely contrast her with season one Arya. Likewise, Sansa could now become the queen in the north, forsaking a happy marriage with the love of her life for a life of service and a marriage of duty and honour, again in contrast to her season one self. Some people may think that's a betrayal of Arya's character, but I think it's more a case of her character actually growing and developing, and her wishes changing over time. Plus, it might have been a nice moment for her to reflect upon her conversation with Ned back in season one, where he said she would be married with children and she said that wasn't her only for her to choose to take that path. And not because someone told her to, but because she wanted to. And considering there's no mention of Ned at the end of the series, it might have been a nice nod to the original lead character that was otherwise ignored in the closing of the series. Regardless of what you might think of that idea, it sure as hell beats her likely dying of dehydration and starvation on the open ocean. John bends the knee to Bran. He says he's sorry he wasn't there when he needed him, and Bran responds he was exactly where he needed to be. I don't know what this pseudo-emotional nonsense is supposed to convey, but this entire scene, and episode, and frankly season, is a complete slap in the face to Jon and all of the sacrifices he made throughout the show. This line also doesn't make any sense. Was Jon exactly where he needed to be when he went beyond the wall to get a white? 
and ended up stranded, leading to the death of Viserion, which the Night King used to breach the wall, that expedition didn't even achieve its goal of getting Cersei on board with fighting the dead. And it gave the Night King what he needed to breach the wall. Was he right where he needed to be when he was murdered by the Night's Watch usurpers? How about when he nearly lost the war to Ramsay and had to be bailed out by the Vale Army? I hate lazy nonsense like this, because it always seems like a weak attempt to paper over the flaws in the writing. We then see Brienne writing in a history book that Jaime died defending his queen, which is a nice touch, and it makes sense that Brienne would want historians to look back and see Jaime in a good and honourable light, but in another way, it's like the writers rubbing salt in the wound after they thoroughly destroyed Jaime's character in episodes 4 and 5. Tyrion assembles the new small council of Davos, Sam, and Bronn, Davos is master of ships, which I suppose makes a certain type of sense, given he was a smuggler that used ships to do his smuggling, and he was a prominent figure in Stannis' fleet. Bronn is master of Coyan, which really doesn't make any sense for a cutthroat. You'd think he'd be master of war or something. Sam is the Grand Maester, despite spending very little time training in Old Town. And Tyrion is the Hand of the King, which also makes a certain type of sense given that he's done the job several times before. The problem, though, is he seemed to be pretty terrible at it as far as Daenerys goes. This is obviously in contrast to his rather successful run as Hand under King Joffrey, and his poor run under Queen Daenerys can be chalked up to the increasingly poor writing of the series as it went on. Still, it does seem odd that Bran would want Tyrion as his Hand, given his recent failings. Brienne and Podrick are also in the King's Guard, which makes sense. Sam presents Tyrion with a written record of the events of the series, titled... A song of ice and fire. And the noise of the collective eye rolls and groans of the viewing audience was loud enough to break the sound barrier. Get it? Because the book series the show is based on is called A Song of Ice and Fire. Does it take Sam a couple of decades to complete this version too? Are the writers implying that the A Song of Ice and Fire series is an adaptation of the events of the Game of Thrones show in some sort of weird meta reference? Because that is hilarious. <laughs> Tyrion says he probably gets criticised a lot in it, and Sam says he's not mentioned. Ha 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 isn't that funny? Let's sacrifice logic for one last lame-ass joke. What do you mean Tyrion isn't mentioned? He was an instrumental part of several history-defining moments throughout the series. His defence plan saved King's Landing from Stannis' invasion. He was Hand of the Queen during Daenerys' invasion when she destroyed King's Landing. Oh, whatever. Who even cares anymore? Bran enters, and he's told that Drogon has been spotted flying east. Bran says he may be able to find him. Find him and do what, exactly? This line also essentially teases that Bran may take control of a dragon. Something that was teased back in the fourth season finale when he met the Three-Eyed Raven for the first time, and was never paid off. Now they tease it again, just as the show is ending, so that it can again never be paid off. Bran then leaves, believing his kingdom to be in safe hands with the new small council, which given Bronn's duplicitousness and Tyrion's recent failures, I'm not sure why you would. Tyrion then begins to tell his brothel joke from back in season one, and that's the last time we see him on the show. Tyrion, a once beloved character who started out as a drunk buffoon telling jokes, became a serious analytical mind invaluable in several battles, and then back to a buffoon telling jokes. Hell of an arc there. Well done, writers. Well done. We then get a montage of our main characters as the series draws to a close. Jon arrives at the wall and is greeted by Tormund. Arya sets sail in her pointless voyage. Sansa becomes queen in the north, and the people bend the knee to her. Even though when the northern army left to fight in King's Landing, Jon was the king in the north. And even though he technically bent the knee to Daenerys, they'd still all recognise him as their king. Especially when word gets back to them that he killed Daenerys because she went mental and started barbecuing innocent people. When the Northerners learn that Jon is the rightful heir to the Iron Throne and killed Daenerys to save everyone's lives, and his reward was not to become king, but to get sent into exile in the North at the Night's Watch, why on earth would they be okay with that? Why would they just accept Sansa as their queen? Don't you think they'd have some questions? First and foremost being, did you fight for Jon? Did you put Jon forward to be king in the meeting in the dragon pit, given that he is the rightful king? Why did you just sit back and agree to send Jon to the wall? Why didn't Bran pardon Jon as soon as he became king? I don't believe for one second that the Northerners would just accept that Jon has to live out his life in exile, while Bran is king and Sansa is queen in the north. 
it would look like Sansa and Bran had betrayed Jon for their own selfish desires to take power. Jon pats Ghost, destroying the notion that the pitiful goodbye shared between the characters in episode 4 was all the series could afford. It seems weird that the writers told that lie to try and cover for the fans' displeasure with that scene. It may have been to avoid spoiling this scene in this episode, or this scene may have been added as a response to the fan outcry. Either way, it's a nice moment that was sorely needed. We then see Jon and the wildlings go beyond the wall where the plants have started to grow again. Which seems odd given that everything is still pretty frozen, but I get the idea the writers were going for with that. Especially the symbolism of a new beginning, so I can let the logic gap go. The score swells and is honestly great as the composer has always done a very good job on the show and this moment is no different. And we see Jon head off into the forest beyond the wall as the series comes to a close. In a different show with an entirely different preceding four seasons, this might have been a great moment to close the show on. In its current state, however, it was a terrible ending to the worst season of the show, and a terrible ending to four terribly disappointing seasons of television, which turned what started as one of the best television series ever into a Dexter-tier botch job. Much like Dexter, it tried to pull off the bittersweet ending that great series like The Shield pulled off to perfection and failed miserably. And for all the dangling threads left behind, and all the unanswered questions, the biggest one of all is the question of what could have been. Well, that brings us to the end of the critique for the series finale of Game of Thrones, The Iron Throne. It also ends the critique of Season 8, but stick around because coming up next, I'm going to break down each character and compare and contrast where they started with where they ended up and I'll give a few ideas for how this mess of a final season could have been fixed. Exactly. Right. Character development? Nah. <laughs> Lob it all Story. in. <laughs> but it, it, I really need to shut you're up. You're brave. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've broken down and analysed every episode of Season 8, let's take a specific look at the characters and compare where they started in Season 1 to where they ended here in Season 8. I'm not going to go over every character because that would take forever, so I'm mostly going to stick to the main characters. Let's start with Daenerys Targaryen. Danny arguably had the biggest character shift of any of the main characters in Game of Thrones, going from a scared and naive young woman into the genocidal maniac she became at the end of the series. So does this arc work? Or make any sense at all? Short answer? No. Daenerys does repeatedly show throughout the series a willingness to get her hands dirty, whether that's killing slavers, Miri Mazdur, Zaro, enemy armies, or even her own people when they betray her. But all of these are understandable to a certain degree, as they are all in response to wrongdoing. It's not until season 7 when Danny burns the Talis for simply refusing to acknowledge her as queen that she kills without merit. And then we are expected to believe that after suffering a few losses, something she has experienced throughout her entire life, that all of a sudden she is willing to slaughter hundreds of thousands of innocent lives. This sudden change from Daenerys makes absolutely no sense. It is a complete betrayal of her character, and stands in firm opposition to the person she has been portrayed as throughout the series. It's a shocking twist to be sure, but a lazily implemented one. In previous seasons, she has always endeavoured to save innocent lives, often at the expense of her own self-interest. I could maybe buy that she snapped mentally, and in this moment, wanted nothing but revenge. But that still doesn't explain why she ignored Cersei in order to slaughter innocent people. It just doesn't make sense no matter which way you cut it. Killing a few people here and there and occasionally shouting fire and blood is not enough to make the slaughter of thousands make sense. Especially given her previous attempts to do what's best for the common people. If you think Daenerys' past actions make her decision to murder the innocent people of King's Landing make sense, then ask yourself, if it had been Arya rather than Daenerys, would it have made sense? Of course not, right? And yet Arya has dealt with a remarkable amount of loss and tragedy. Entire chunks of her family have been brutally killed, including her own father right in front of her. She's lost friends and loved ones and nearly been killed herself several times over. Not to mention she was trained as an assassin and has a burning hatred of Cersei for what she has inflicted on her friends and family. 
If we're going to use previous experiences and trauma as a justification for Daenerys' genocide, then by that logic it would make sense if you swapped Arya into that position, right? But of course no one would believe that Arya would do something like that. It wouldn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense that Daenerys would do it either. It completely destroyed her character and ruined her arc. If the writers wanted her arc to end with her essentially becoming her father reborn, then they needed to earn it. They didn't. Next up, let's analyse the arc of Jon Snow. He starts as the bastard son of Ned Stark, headed to the Night's Watch. He goes beyond the wall, falls in love, chooses his duty as a man of the Watch over his love of Ygritte, watches her die in his arms, becomes Lord Commander, is assassinated by his own men, is resurrected, leaves the Watch to fight for his family, wins back Winterfell in battle, falls in love with Daenerys, wins the war with the dead, kills Daenerys after she commits a genocide, and is exiled to the Night's Watch. On the surface, there is a nice little poetic arc, with his story starting and ending with sacrifice and his life essentially being one big tragedy. However, I feel this arc is a failure too. Not quite on the level of Daenerys, but still a failure. Because after he is killed, almost nothing he does has any actual substance to it. His death feels like a pointless exercise that accomplishes nothing as he is resurrected in the next episode. After that, he is about to lose the war for Winterfell, and has to be bailed out by the Vale. Then he does nothing of value in Season 7. In Season 8, he doesn't kill the Night King, Arya does, despite it being set up in Season 5 that he would be the one to at least fight the Night King, if not outright kill him. He is then shown to be an ineffectual leader in the battle for King's Landing. Then he kills Daenerys and is exiled up north. John accomplishes absolutely nothing after his resurrection. His story seemed to be the bastard child who is secretly the rightful heir to the Iron Throne, who fights in many battles and eventually takes the throne. I know that's something of a cliche and a bit on the nose, but I think there is a middle ground that could have been reached between that and what we got. A bittersweet ending, or an ending that subverts cliche, doesn't need to be him never sitting on the throne. It could have been him sitting on the throne as a matter of duty, despite not wanting to which would tie in directly with the values he learned from Ned Stark, and would stand in contrast with the values of the Targaryens we've seen throughout the series, who all want the throne for their own personal glory, or a sense of it being owed to them. Instead of Jon's arc being thematically resonant, it ended up being a flat, empty bucket of nothingness, achieved thanks to a desperate attempt to avoid cliché and to be subversive. The problem with that is that when you set a story up and then deliberately don't pay it off, that's not subversive or avoiding cliché. It's just bad writing. Now let's look at Tyrion. He starts off as a somewhat ostracized dwarf in a powerful family. He becomes Hand of the King in his father's stead when his nephew takes the throne. He leads the defense of King's Landing against the invasion of Stannis Baratheon. He is eventually put on trial for his nephew's murder and found guilty. He escaped prison with the help of his brother Jaime kills his father and flees to Essos. There he finds Daenerys Targaryen and becomes her hand. His advice and counsel repeatedly gets her in trouble to the point he almost seemed to be subconsciously sabotaging her. He does an awful lot of walking, typically through bloody battlegrounds. Then he quits being her hand after she commits genocide, convinces Jon to kill her, and then talks to the other lords and ladies into electing Bran as king. He then takes the position of Hand once again. So, is his arc effective? No. Not just because of the failure that is the writing, but because effectively he has no arc. His arc really should have been to go from a dwarf living in the shadow of his family, and burdened with being his father's son, unable to live the life he wants because of it, to a man casting off the shackles of the circumstances of his life, and going out on his own to live a life he can be happy with. The payoff of his arc should have been the rejection of the political scheming and drunken whoring. He should have learned the truth about his wife, and the series should have ended with him going off to find her. Even if the goal was futile or basically impossible, the attempt would have been the payoff. Instead, he's basically in the same place he was when the series began, in a position of authority under the king cracking lame jokes. It's a shame because the performance of Peter Dinklage is really solid and he started out as a great character, but after season 4, much like many of the other characters and the series as a whole, he just didn't have anything to do. The decision to remove the Taisha reveal when Jaime frees him from prison completely kills his motivation going forward. If we had seen the moment properly adapted with Jaime telling him the truth about his first wife, 
It would have made Tyrion's choice to kill his father mean much more and make more sense, but it also would have given him a conflict to resolve with Jaime down the line, and a goal to accomplish, finding his wife. As it stands, all he does is get drunk, tell jokes, and give Daenerys terrible advice. I've covered Sansa and Arya somewhat throughout this critique, and there's not much more that can be said. I think with Arya they had the potential to pay off some of her earlier scenes with her father back in season 1, and subvert expectations with her arc, and that would have simply required her to accept Gendry's marriage proposal. It may seem at odds with her free spirit and rebellious nature, but that's why I say it would have been subversive, something the writers seemed obsessed with regardless of if it made sense. It also would have worked in stark contrast to Sansa, who started the series desperately wanting to get married. If her story ended with her too focused on ruling the North, and organising treaties and so on to get married and start a family, and Arya, by contrast, having crossed off all the names on her list, remember that, decides to leave her life of adventure and settle down for a quiet life, a life she never imagined having or wanting, and yet the life her father had hoped she'd have. It would have been a nice poetic twist to their characters. In the end, Sansa became queen in the north without really earning it. It was just handed to her by her brother Bran, essentially. And Arya goes off to become a fucking explorer. Their arcs failed through sheer dullness alone. I don't have time to cover every single character because this video would be 20 hours long, so I'm going to wrap this section up by discussing Cersei and Jaime. Cersei starts out as the bitter and nasty queen to King Robert, and ends the series as the bitter and nasty queen of her own kingdom. Despite Maggie the Frog claiming she will have three children and outlive them all, she actually has four children because the show added an extra one. The show also leaves off the Valonqar prophecy because Cersei being killed by some falling debris is much more satisfying than her dying courtesy of one of her siblings. We couldn't have Jaime finally separating from Cersei by killing her to protect the innocent people of King's Landing. No. Instead we get a brick falling on her head. Quick, someone fetch these guys another Emmy! Speaking of Jaime, his arc might be the biggest disappointment in the series, because despite a few rough patches here and there, his character and arc was largely intact until the final couple of episodes. He starts out a cocky and downright evil man, willing to kill children to keep his incest a secret, and yet over time he develops into an endearing and honest person, and eventually in what was one of the best scenes in the series, his character and motivations are recontextualized, and we see that he is essentially the most misjudged man in Westeros. He loses his hand, which takes away his most valuable skill, sword fighting, and he is humbled because of it. He learns there is more to life than his toxic relationship with Cersei, and appears to move on, eventually leaving her to go and fight the good fight in the north. And then it's all ruined when he abandons the woman he has grown to love over the course of the series, Brienne, in favour of rushing back to Cersei to die alongside her. What a disastrous ending to his arc. Sure, there were a couple of mistakes along the way. His attempted rape of Cersei in season 4 made no sense and he essentially meanders around for most of season 5 and 6, but things seem to be back on track at the end of season 7, when he finally chose to leave Cersei, choosing his honour over his love for her. And then, like with just about everything else in this show, they ruined it. It's such a shame because Jamie was perhaps the richest and most detailed and developed character in the series. The fact that he was looked at as an oath-breaking traitor for killing the Mad King, when he did so to save innocent lives, is a brilliant character beat and the transformation from the downright hateful Kingslayer to Honourable Man was very well done and properly earned in a way that Daenerys' transformation from Honourable Woman to Genocidal Maniac wasn't. Honestly, the failure to properly conclude Jaime's arc might be the biggest blunder the series made. A real shame. You know, if you've planned your book that the butler did it, and then you read an internet, someone has figured out that the butler did it, and you suddenly change in midstream, and it was the chambermaid who did it, mm. then you screw up the whole book, because you get these, this foreshadowing early on, and you've got these little clues you planted, now they're dead ends, and you have to introduce other clues, and you're retconning, it's a mess. Now that we've covered the arcs of the main characters, there's just one more thing to cover. How would I fix this mess? Now, truth be told, I'm going to have to give a short version of this, and it's only going to cover season 8. This is because I plan to do a much larger rewrite of the entire series later on, so I figure I might as well leave the rewrite of the first seven seasons for that video. Plus, this video is already very long. <laughs> the first and perhaps biggest issue with the season is the length. For what the writers needed to accomplish, six episodes is just too damn short. 
we need a full 10 episode season. Without getting bogged down in the details, the major moments the season needs to cover are as follows. 1. A resolution to the White Walker storyline, picking up where we left off last season with the Night King's invasion of Westeros. 2. A resolution to the King's Landing storyline with Cersei being removed as Queen. 3. A resolution to Daenerys' goal of claiming the Iron Throne. 4. A resolution to the story of Jon Snow and his rightful claim to the Iron Throne. And 5. A satisfying conclusion to the arcs of our major characters. There is certainly more work to be done given the myriad of dangling plot threads that are thus far unanswered or explained, but if the season can manage these five points, it will somewhat salvage the series and give the viewers a satisfying conclusion. I'd love nothing more than to find out what was going on with Quaithe, what the plans Doran had were, and what Daria was up to. And there are dozens more plot lines that are left unresolved or are hurriedly tied up in disappointing fashion that, in a better series, would have been dealt with properly. I'll try and tackle all those in my future comprehensive rewrite video, but for now, I'll just be focusing on the five points I mentioned moments ago. So let's start with number one, the resolution to the White Walker storyline. In concluding the White Walker storyline, we need to figure out what the White Walkers and the Night King stand for allegorically, and what their purpose in the story is. Many see the White Walkers as an allegory for the damage man has caused nature, or Mother Nature's wrath which I think is a fine allegory. The bigger question is how the hell do you wrap up a storyline that is essentially a metaphor for the wrath of nature? Well, I imagine the writers of Game of Thrones came about the same conundrum when writing this season, and instead decided to drop the allegory and treat the White Walkers as literally as possible. Essentially, they are ice zombies and nothing more. That's a shame because there are a bunch of ways you could incorporate them into the other conflicts in the series and pay off the allegory. For example, the warring factions could come together to fight the threat of the Night King, the Night King could destroy certain important human monuments such as the Wall, and perhaps most importantly the Iron Throne, before humanity comes together to defeat him and his army. The metaphor being that man must acknowledge his mistakes and work together to fix them, or he will be doomed to wear the full brunt of Mother Nature. The destruction of the Wall and the Iron Throne would be somewhat obvious metaphors for man's trivial attempts to control nature. So I'd have the Night King and his army be destroyed in King's Landing during a battle for the fate of the world, with all sides of the human conflict coming together to defeat the Night King, and afterwards signing a treaty that states that in times of great need, all sides will come together as necessary. It's not the best metaphor, and it's certainly more than a little on the nose, but it beats just killing the Night King in the first battle. Number 2, The Death of Cersei. For this to work, we really need Jaime in King's Landing during the battle with the Night King and the battle for the Iron Throne between Daenerys and Cersei's forces. So let's take my idea from part one of this critique, which is that the Long Night battle in episode three would be revealed to have only taken up a small portion of the Night King's forces, with the Night King no-showing the battle. The Night King sent in the equivalent of the Dothraki charge just to see what would happen. The battle nearly destroys the living, and they are devastated when they realise that it was just the beginning, and that many more battles are to come. They decide to take Daenerys' fleet, which hasn't yet been destroyed by Euron, and sail the rest of the army south to King's Landing, stopping along the way to gather more soldiers in the Vale and the Riverlands and elsewhere, and to battle the army of the dead again, each time depleting the Night King's forces, whilst taking heavy casualties of their own. Daenerys sails ahead to King's Landing in an attempt to put aside the battle with Cersei. Jaime and Brienne accompany Daenerys to King's Landing, and much of the season is split between the battles on the mainland and the attempt to parley with Cersei. At each stop, we can wrap up the stories of the characters we've met along the way, like Ed Sheeran and Hot Pie. Eventually, we get to the standoff between Daenerys and Cersei, with the battle between Jon's forces and the army of the dead close behind. Daenerys loses patience and is on the verge of taking the Iron Throne by force and taking command of the city's forces and the Lannister army to fight the dead. Jaime asks for one chance to convince Cersei to surrender as he can see Daenerys is close to breaking point. Danny could even make a remark about igniting the wildfire right underneath Cersei if that's what it takes. We then get the final scene between Cersei and Jaime, but instead of a sappy reunion where they hug and then the ceiling caves in, We get a proper scene that gets out all of the baggage throughout their entire relationship. Eventually we get to the point where Jaime is pleading with Cersei to surrender, but she refuses. She takes him to the Wall of King's Landing, where she executes someone close to Daenerys that had been captured during the stalemate. Perhaps Masande, as in the show. 
Daenerys could then destroy the scorpions on the wall of the Red Keep, and then fly straight for Cersei in a rage, leaving a line of destruction right through the centre of the city, straight to Cersei. Jaime sees Daenerys accidentally ignite some of the wildfire caches in a rage, and in one last ditch effort to save the city, strangles Cersei to death, thus realising the Valonqar prophecy that Cersei would be killed by a younger brother, and once again killing the reigning monarch to save the city, this time killing a woman he has loved his entire life. Cersei is dead, and Daenerys is the de facto queen. Number 3. Queen Daenerys With Cersei now dead, Daenerys is essentially the queen. She arrives at the tower, and sees that Jaime has strangled Cersei. She calms down, and comes to her senses, and realises what she has accidentally done in a rage. Killed innocent people, and set off some of the wildfire caches. She is horrified at what she has done, and is unsure how she allowed herself to get into that state. Meanwhile, Jaime sends word to the Lannister forces that Cersei is dead, and that he is taking command. Which is good news, because Jon Snow has just arrived with the army of the dead close behind. Daenerys is essentially Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, and Jaime even acknowledges her as such. But she is too shaken by what she has done, and demands they leave all formality surrounding it until after the battle with the dead. After all, it may all be pointless. Number 4. Jon Snow and the Iron Throne The Night King and his army arrive in King's Landing. They have been severely depleted, but are still a formidable threat, even for the combined forces of Westeros, which also include the Dornish army at this point. It's life against death in the ultimate battle of the series. In this battle, several main characters would die, and some would have died in the battles that led up to this point. It's funny that Game of Thrones gained notoriety as the show that killed off important characters, but like many things with the show, that changed after season 4. Suddenly, main characters were untouchable and only the side characters were killed off. Eventually, the battle comes down to Jon and Daenerys riding Drogon and Rhaegal, versus the Night King riding Viserion. They destroy the roof of the throne room, and the Night King knocks Daenerys off Drogon. She hides behind the throne, and he attempts to kill her with dragon fire. She is unaffected, as fire cannot kill a dragon, even as the Iron Throne melts around her. Jon throws a Valerian dagger at the Night King, stabbing him and knocking him off of Viserion, but he doesn't die. Viserion attempts to kill Jon, and we see a dragon fight between Viserion, Drogon, and Rhaegal. Jon outsmarts Viserion, and is able to stab him in the eye with dragonglass, killing him. Jon and the Night King fight in the throne room, and eventually Jon is able to mount Rhaegal, and Danny mounts Drogon, and together they destroy the Night King with dragonfire. Again, this isn't exactly an original idea, but it's essentially fire and ice coming together to destroy the undead. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it's still better than this. The series needs a fundamental rewrite to truly get a proper payoff to everything, but I think this would be a more satisfying ending than the one we got. That's whilst keeping everything the same from seasons 1 to 7. And during the climactic battle with the Night King, Euron blows a horn in an attempt to take control of one of Daenerys' dragons only to actually awaken a fucking kraken from under the sea, which consumes the silence and Euron along with it. Why? Because I like krakens and I think it'll look cool. That's reason enough at this point in the show, isn't it? And it'll be a better ending for his character than dying in a pointless fight with Jaime. I'm the man who got eaten by a fucking kraken. With the Night King and Cersei dead, it's time to figure out who will sit on the Iron Throne. We cut to some time later, with the lords and ladies meeting in the dragon pit, ready for Daenerys' coronation. Jon goes to bend the knee, as does everyone, but Daenerys stops them. She explains that history books will speak of the battle they fought and won, but it must also speak the truth in its entirety. And that truth is for a moment, she did something horrifying. She let her rage and anger take over. Fire and blood was always meant for her enemies, the enemies of the people and she allowed herself to bring fire and blood to the very people she swore to protect. The others claim it was an accident, and she agrees, and states it's an accident that she cannot allow herself to repeat. If she were to sit on the Iron Throne, she would have absolute power, and who would be able to rein her in then? She wants to sit the throne, and she has believed since she were a child that it is her right to sit on the throne. But she was wrong. The throne should be held by a Targaryen, yes but not Daenerys Targaryen. It should be sat upon by the true, rightful heir to the Iron Throne, the living son of Rhaegar Targaryen, Aegon Targaryen, or Jon Snow. Jon reaffirms that he doesn't want it, 
but Daenerys states he must take it, as it is his duty. She says that ruling isn't about what any of us want, but about what is best for our people and what is best for Westeros. And what is best for Westeros is for Jon to sit upon the Iron Throne. The others are all in agreement. Daenerys says she will return to Dragonstone and rebuild their ancestral seat, and will be happy to be a part of his kingdom. She then bends the knee to Jon, as he had done for her, and declares him king. The visual of Jon Snow sitting upon a throne he doesn't want out of a sense of duty to the people is quite the bittersweet ending to the series, and I think it would have served as the perfect conclusion. Number five, the other character conclusions. All that's left is to wrap up the stories for the other major characters, so instead of pointlessly sailing off towards nothing, Arya would settle down with Gendry. Sansa would focus more on ruling Winterfell rather than starting a family. Tyrion would forsake his life of drinking, scheming, and whoring to go and find his long-lost wife. Brienne and Jaime marry and serve as the heads of the Lannister family in Casterly Rock. Cersei is buried with her children at Casterly Rock. Daenerys returns to Dragonstone, where she begins to rebuild her ancestral home. Sam serves Jon as maester. Bran heads to Old Town to correct the historical record of Westeros where needed. The wildlings settle in the north underneath House Stark. And Jon sits on the newly built Iron Throne, with Ghost and Rhaegal by his side, longing for a different life he can never have, but hoping to do his father proud. And that is that. We have come to the end of this critique of Season 8 of Game of Thrones. I'll go into much more detail about how I'd rewrite the season, and series as a whole, in an upcoming video. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this concluding part, and the critique as a whole. It's certainly the most ambitious project I've ever undertaken, but I've really enjoyed making these and seeing all of your reactions to it. I will continue to make long-form content like this going forward. I have a few projects in the works, and will be taking a short break from Game of Thrones to cover a couple of other topics, including the DCEU. I'm also going to start streaming soon, once I figure out how to do it, and I'll try and cover some more topical films and series from time to time. When I come back to Game of Thrones later this year, I'll be beginning my critique of Season 5, so look forward to those projects coming soon. I also have a second channel which covers pro wrestling, which I'll try and upload to more frequently. You can find the link for that, as well as all my other links in the description and in the pinned comment. Thank you very much for watching, I would really like to turn this from a hobby into a career, and your support is getting me closer all the time to doing that. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. And who has a better story than Brand the Broken? Oh my god, what even is this? I mean, look at this thing, what is this, are you retarded? Maybe the decision about what's best for everyone should be left to... Well, everyone. <laughs> Maybe we should give the dogs a vote as well. I think all the fat went into your brain that made your shit all retarded. <laughs> <laughs>